Now, I was around during the Reagan administration, and Reagan didn't get his, his top priority program domestic through until August, which was his across-the-board tax cuts. He didn't run home to California and say, you know what, I'm going after this group, uh, this group's on my list, I'm going to start working with these. No, he kept at it and kept at it and kept at it. He understood the particulars of what he was doing, and more than that, strongly principled. He knew this needed to be done for the benefit of the nation. It wasn't a matter of him having a victory. It was a matter of the American people having a victory. Which gets me to the next point. This bill that was killed, thanks to those 18 conservatives, needed to be killed. It was a disaster. It was not going to lower your premiums. It was not going to lower your deductibles. Small insurance companies are going to go broke under this stuff. Big insurance companies want to get the hell out of it, too. So it was never going to work. It was not a repeal. It was not a repeal. The bait and switch stuff is unbelievable. And so now, I want to play for you a little bit of uh, Paul Ryan from January 2016. By my calculation, that's about 14 months ago. Paul Ryan, let's watch him. Cut, one, go. It's no surprise that someone named Obama vetoed a bill repealing Obamacare. And we will hold a vote to override this veto, taking this process all the way to the end under the Constitution. But here's the thing. The idea that Obamacare is the law of the land for good is a myth. This law will collapse under its own weight or it will be repealed because all those rules and procedures Senate Democrats have used to block us from doing this, that's all history. We have shown now that there is a clear path to repealing Obamacare without 60 votes in the Senate. So next year... Stop! Did you hear that? Without 60 votes in the... Did you hear that? Of course you heard that. Without 60 votes in the United States Senate. Repeal. It doesn't even get into replace. Repeal. All these regulations, all this larded up stuff. We have a way to do it without 60 votes in the Senate. This is just 14 months ago, ladies and gentlemen. You relied on this man and others and what they said. And now they've reversed course. They're, they're, they're like uh, gymnasts, jumping all over the place and swinging all over the place, uh, so forth and so on. They have deceived you and they have deceived me. Now we're supposed to line up behind them as if this never took place. What is so hard about this? Keep that right there. Look at this. I have books here. Ronald Reagan, Abraham Lincoln, Calvin Coolidge. These are great men. They're great men for a reason. You know, we're not talking about the president who leads a civil war with massive casualties and so forth, trying to keep the nation together. We're not talking about, in the case of Ronald Reagan, trying to destroy this massive threat, worldwide threat of communism in the Soviet Union. And I can go on and on. We're talking about passing a damn bill to repeal Obamacare. And they attack the conservatives who say, you're not repealing Obamacare. You're creating another monstrosity. Go ahead. To a Republican president, it will get signed into law. Obamacare will Stop. be gone. We get a Republican president, it will be signed into law. What will? Repeal. It'll get through the Senate without 60 votes. And a Republican president will sign it. Do you hear this? I want to thank our friends at Conservative Review for finding this, digging it. Go ahead. And then, for all the people who have seen their premiums go up, for people who have lost their plan or their doctor, for people who have to deal with all the mandates, the restrictions, and the red tape, we can replace this law with a truly patient-centered health care system. Stop. It's just a matter. Notice he said, and then. So it's seriatim. It's a process. Once we repeal it, we don't need 60 votes in the Senate. The Republican president will sign it. Then we can replace it. Is this not exactly what the conservatives at the Freedom Caucus have been saying? It is exactly what they've been saying. And for this, they are trashed. They're, tra they're trashed by the Wall Street Journal editorial page. Those fools, which I'll get to later, the Obamacare Republic. Very clever, Paul Gigo, the editor page uh, chief. You're a moron. Or the Fox host, Judge Janine. 
Oh, she's screaming, oh, work with the Democrats, man, work with the Democrats. Settle down, will you? And the rest of them. Now, I want you to listen to a sober person, Tom Cotton, senator from Arkansas. He was on Deface the Nation uh, yesterday, and here's what he had to say. Go ahead. Senator, welcome. In the Washington Examiner, Philip Klein writes, or the headline to his piece is, GOP cave on Obamacare repeal is the biggest broken promise in political history. What's your reaction to that judgment? Well, John, for, first I'd say the president is right that the Democrats gave us Obamacare and the failure of this bill this week doesn't solve the problems of Obamacare. It's continuing to get worse and our healthcare system is groaning under the weight of Obamacare. So we have to revisit it. We now have the time to do it in a more deliberate and careful fashion. But ultimately, I don't think you can lay the defeat of this bill last week on any single faction in the House of Representatives. Some conservatives opposed it, some moderates opposed it, even chairman of powerful committees opposed it. I just think the problem was with first the bill and then the process. Healthcare is a very complicated issue. To release a bill uh, that was written in secret and then expect to pass it in 18 days, I just don't think was feasible. So you said written in secret. Well, that's on Paul Ryan then. I mean, he controls that process. So, it, so are you saying basically that the House leaders, the House Speaker, did it, the process was, was poorly handled? I think you can't expect to try to solve a problem that addresses one-sixth of the country's economy and touches every American in a very personal and intimate way in 18 days. You know, when the Democrats came to power in 2009, for 60 years at least they had been pursuing a national health care system, yet they didn't introduce legislation for eight months. They didn't pass it for over a year of Barack Obama's first term. So they went through very public hearings and took testimony, developed a fact-based foundation of knowledge. President Obama traveled around the country, held town halls. He spoke to a joint session of Congress. I'm not saying that we needed 14 months to do this, but I think a more, a more careful and deliberate <laughs> approach, which we now have time to do, because we're going to have to revisit health care anyway, would have gotten us further down the path towards a solution. I, I believe that both conservatives and moderates in the House made a lot of concessions already. And I have friends like Jim Jordan in the Freedom Caucus and, and Charlie Dent in the Tuesday group. And I know that they're both good men. They want to work together. They want to try to find a solution that both they and everyone in between can agree to. With time, I think we can do that. So your judgment, just so nobody mistakes your message, is that the House rushed it? I, th I think the House moved a bit too fast. Okay. Eight, 18 days is simply not enough time for such major landmark legislation. And not only that, may I ask you a question, ladies and gentlemen, who wrote this bill? Which person or group of people wrote this bill, actually wrote the bill? We don't know. Now, they had seven years to put something really good together. Did you think this was really good? I mean, to plagiarize from Obamacare, put some bells and whistles on it, slap the word federalism on it and choice and things like that, where there's no minimal federalism and choice, and to think that we're just going to fall for it. I mean, you and I, we're the people who are the customers, the consumers of this health care system. And no, we're not going to fall for it. And yet, the attack is on. Now, I would say this to President Trump. You swing over with the Democrats, these are not your typical Democrats. They are radicalized, and they are hate-filled. For you, in particular, Mr. President, you're going to shrink your base. You abandon conservative policies, you're not going to expand your base, you're going to shrink your base. Now, you'll still have your diehards who will back you no matter what, but that becomes a smaller and smaller percentage of the population. Now, I do have a concern how he can expand his support base, though. I'm not talking about the base, support base. My concern is, and I wrote this to myself this morning, that he will lurch left, that he and his advisors in, uh, will lurch left. He's got advisors who are New York City liberal Democrats, like Gary Kahn, the guy from Goldman Sachs, and his son-in-law, and his daughter. And those are just three. There are others. His Treasury Secretary is a former Soros uh, worker and so forth. This is a problem. It's a huge problem. That's number one. Number two, he's surrounded by these liberals, progressives, and he's also He's got a, a populist nationalist in Steve Miller and a populist ma nationalist in Steve Bannon. But where are the constitutional conservatives? In the inner circle. There's not one. And this is what's missing. You can get advice from all these corners, but there's a corner missing. And that's what happens. And then that, now they're at war with constitutional conservatives. Constitutional conservatives, we make up the bulk of the conservative base. Of the conservative base.
and there wouldn't be a Trump presidency but for constitutional conservatives deciding to support him after a very brutal primary process. But even all of that aside, we have the right solutions for America. It's not more centralized health care and more centralized government. 